Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast where we talk about the agronomic science and the cultural management practices that regenerate plant health, and soil health, and public health, and of course, very importantly, regenerate farm profitability and the pathway to achieving all these other outcomes. I'm really excited to be having a conversation for this episode with Joe Lewis, who has been on the forefront of a lot of foundational research on how insects communicate with their environment, with their plants, uh, and with and identifying target insects. So I'm really excited to have Joe here. He has also published a new book recently titled A New Farm Language. And this is a topic that's really important to me personally because I think we constrain ourselves a lot by the choice of words that we use. Words are powerful. And if we constantly refer to things as pests or weeds or pathogens, then to some degree, we're creating the reality that we expect. And we would be wise, I believe, to choose better words and to develop a new lexicon and a new language. So but Joe, the title of your book really spoke to me a lot. I really appreciated it. And thank you for being here today. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, your story and what brought you to doing some of this foundational research? Sure, John. And it's, let me say it's a delight to be with you today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I've seen some of your uh, work and your broadcast, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it today. And it's an exciting thing. And we share so much of the same view and uh, and hopefully we can have a good conversation and communicate some of those to the audience. So I look forward to it. And my background, you know, of course, I'm just completed a, a, a an exciting career as a scientist in the field of entomology and agriculture specifically. Um, but, you know, the, after 40 plus years of academic research and being uh, in that field. I want to point out my earlier years were far from scholarly. I grew up in a, a very remote uh, rural area of South Mississippi as a sharecropper's son. My father was illiterate, couldn't read or write a single word. The earlier years of my life, it, uh, with no electricity, no running water, none of the modern conveniences. And then I had the opportunity later to go to through and have a good education and to be a part of the um, modern technology and in the world from a very different view for for 40 plus years so i've seen the world from both sides now and let's talk a little bit if i could about those earlier years <laughs> uh you know, I, I refer to it and I speak of it as being like Charles Dickens, uh, it's the worst of times and best of times. It was the worst of times and that, that type of life, it can be very rugged and, uh, and particularly as from a perspective of today when we're used to our air conditioning and all the modern conveniences of, of running water and those kind of things. But uh it was the best of time in that we were a part of nature. We didn't just uh, see nature, we were of nature. Uh, when you do not have any electric lights and those type of things, uh, number one, you have to live as a part of nature and hear the sounds of nature, see and feel nature. You have to do things by the light because you don't have the convenience of electric lights and other kinds of things. Uh, you don't have the commotions of all of the commerce and you, you hear and see and experience nature in a very, very different way. And you can read and you, you understand the language of nature. And I think that is huge. You also see the true marvels and understand and appreciate the fact that uh, nature is a web. You don't see it in the reductionist view that we do at the current time. Uh, as Rachel Carson said, in nature, nothing exists alone. And you see and experience that and you, you see it's truly a system. 
nature and our world is a made up of systems within systems. But in our modern world, we centralize and specialize things and you see it in parts and we lose so much in, in the power and we've become very interventionist oriented. So I watched that occur over my life in the earlier stages as that took place. This process of fragmentation and um, this, this mechanistic view of trying to identify and understand the parts, I think is based on the premise, uh, the mistaken belief that if you understand the parts, then you can also understand the whole. Mm -hmm. And I think we're beginning to recognize that that is not the case. You cannot understand the whole just because you recognize the parts. And this is really a challenge in our agricultural research, because if anything is a description of managing an ecosystem, it should be agriculture. And yet our science, our agricultural science has all been fragmented to where we have people studying very specific things rather than the whole ecosystem. Absolutely. And let me compare that a little bit about kind of what I saw earlier and go back and say a couple of things of that because of the way I grew up and saw those things. It helped me to see things different and observe things as I got into my research. So hold that. I want to come to that, not forget it. But see, as you grow up in true subsistence farming, way we lived and farm, we were sharecroppers. We didn't own the land, so we lived on uh, maybe had access to maybe fifty acres or something like that where we had to make our living and actually grow our food. Uh, we had five acres of cotton as a cash crop. That was the only, uh, I guess, money that we had. Everything else, we grew our food. In, in that kind of living, you see the interaction of the parts. You have chickens, you have cows, and, and you have your mew, and you have the cotton and corn uh, to feed the cattle and, and the chickens who all were free range chickens. So you knew your connection to the land. You, you had the cows, you milked them, you had to churn the butter, all those things all the way back to the land. You understood those connections and the interactions of the part. You also saw things like if you had Martin the houses and so forth to see them to chase the hawks and to protect the chickens you you saw all the uh, you know the interactions and in, in for a child with a robust curiosity which i have you're exploring and you see the adventures the beauty and also the power within the natural world and and how interactive and integrated it was it, you didn't see it in its part so seeing the world in that way uh i think it helped me in the research not to break things in its parts uh so completely we, we understood for even as we studied I got into a very strong interest very early in my career of biological control and natural enemies of herbivores, primarily the parasitic wasp. That became the primary subject of my study. And I could see when you took those little parasitic wasps out of nature and start producing them in the lab, once you, once you unplug them, from that natural system, you didn't have the same organism. Wow. It was very, very different. So that gets at the, uh, the point that you were making. And so I, I think uh, it helped to understand the world is an integrated system and to get the best of re research and to understand natural system, you have to study it in its whole. And so that's the way we did our research. So tell us a little bit about the research. I mentioned briefly that you were a pioneer or in, in an early group of researchers looking at developing biological controls and, and uh, kind of practical entomology from a, an agricultural perspective. Yeah. Um, 
Tell us about what brought you there and what got started. Well, uh, the as I was saying, I got developed uh, interest real early just from uh, looking at insects and agriculture and particularly production of cotton and corn and row crops in the South. Uh, I developed a strong interest in the natural enemies and particularly the model that we can discuss a bit here that we use were, were, were the parasitic wasp. And uh, what we recognized, if we were going to use biological control and to re- move away from so much emphasis on pesticides and interventions and, and capture the natural power built within, these were a very important thing. And the key to their reliability and successful employment was how does a female uh, parasitic wasp find those herbivores? And so it, we that became the key point of our study very early because you think about it, here you have a little parasitic wasp that can develop only in a certain types of caterpillars that's playing hide and seek with them in a huge a field of cotton and all the vegetative growth. How do they find those little caterpillars and deposit an egg within them? So that, that was the heart of the subject. And as we begin to uncover some things, it really got exciting because one of the things that we found was the plant has attributes we had no idea that existed. Uh, We found in the first discovery, the first report of the fact that plants, when they're being fed on by a caterpillar or any other herbivore, they have an attribute that we did not know. And that was they have the ability to begin to produce and emit body odors, like an SOS signal sending out a cry for help to their natural enemy and recruit them to their aid. And the wasp is able to locate the host based on that signal from the plant. Uh, Had we suggested that a few years earlier, we would have been laughed out of the profession, but it is an inducible response. So we really got into working out how does this occur? What's the mechanism by which a plant can talk and send signals to their uh, bodyguards? And we will call them the parasitic wasp. And what we found is that when the caterpillar or any herbivore we later found is that all plants have this ability as we went on. But when we first discovered we were working primarily with corn and cotton. When you, when they wound the plant, they start munching on the fruit or leaf or whatever wounded. Uh, The plant detects this feeding and begins to crank up a set of chemical factors and produce a group of, you know, six, seven, ten com- compounds, a, a, a blend of body odors, and emit those odors. And these are quite volatile materials that the, and the wasp can see. Now, you don't see it, but the wasp can see it. It's kind of like a smoke signal <laughs> that the plant is emitting to recruit them. And <clears throat> this is, uh, now, what we found using wind tunnels and other, other study methods is if you just wound the plant with, say, a razor blade or somehow cut it or wound it, this doesn't happen. What happens is that there's an elicitor we found in the spit of the caterpillar. And if you take the spit of the caterpillar and put on, you wound it artificially and put the spit of the caterpillar, you get the same thing that happens naturally. So there's an elicitor. And we are working with Jim Tomlinson, who was my chemist friend that did all this work with me. This elicitor 
triggers the plant and to do that. So you have to have the spit of the caterpillar. And the, he and his group identified that uh, chemical, which was a fatty acid. And <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is the way that has occurred. Now, each herbivore, they do it for any feeding, but they produce a different blend, slightly different for each herbivore. So if you have an army worm and a, a bow worm, or aphids, uh, uh, any other insect feeding on it, they're producing these body odors for each one of these. Now, <clears throat> because of that, it would be of little value if if the natural enemy, if the parasitic wasp couldn't recognize the difference between these, if you see what I'm saying, then <clears throat> so it, the blend is a little different and they recognize the blend for each, what only their whole thing wow. able to distinguish it. So, wow. so basically, uh, I, I, want to, I want to hear your comment, but just to say, it is because they're sending a little different. It's like you're going into the store and you're getting different items and you have a barcode and the barcode is a little different for each. They are sending a different signal and the parasitic, can, it, they're talking to the wasp and they're telling them something's feeding on it and what it is. So there, it's actually truly like a language, if you see what I'm saying. Wow. So plants produce a unique signal for every pest, every insect herbivore. Just look at that. I just used the word pest again. <laughs> for every insect herbivore that feeds on them, a unique one for each one. What, uh, what is the distance that this signal reaches? What's the sensitivity of these parasitic wasps? And how, how accurately can they perceive or which plants are infected or which fields are infected. We know it's like parts per billion. It amounts to the fact that if you're sitting in this room and you get a few molecules just uh, uh, emitted, they can pick it up. It's incredibly sensitive. And they can navigate and follow these odors in a little turbulent environment. We actually did those kind of studies and found that they're able to navigate those uh, very good. So it really is a, an, an incredible sensitive system that is certainly in the range of the same thing as the bloodhound. We did those types of studies. Now there's another side of this, John. Um, since there's a different blend, and because they're emitting these, all these uh, odors and they're in response to any herbivore feeding on it. And they also, the plant, let's say you have a, uh, a the bow worm, for example, that's feeding on cotton. These are the corn worm or an army worm. And what our study was really with wasp of the bow worm. Uh, primarily, <clears throat> we did some with army worms too, but these are polyphagous insects, as we call them. They feed on a variety of different plants, and all these plants are signaling. The signal the, the, is the same basic mechanism in the plant, but it's different on different plants. So what I'm saying is they've got to follow a different signal in cotton or corn or some early season annual that their host is feeding on. So they can't afford to hardwire this signal. They just don't have the innate ability in a specific plant signal sent to them. So they, how do they respond to a different blend or a signal variation from one plant to the next or one age of plant to the next. They can't hardwire that. So we find they accomplish they have to learn. Yeah, that's exactly it. They learn. And they are incredibly 
good at learning. And we really work that system out. So let's talk a little bit about that learning mechanism. What they do is it's the same as occurs in vertebrates. Uh, in 1988, we actually reported in nature the first demonstration with these wasps of true associative learning with these insects. <clears throat> What happens when they encounter the site and there's the uh, caterpillar host and they have feces where they have fed or they touch the caterpillar themselves, there is a chemical in the feces that actually comes from the paratropic membrane. It, that's the, and our only insect itself, the caterpillar, that's, it, we find that we didn't identify that, but it's a glycoprotein, a real heavy compound, chemical, that is host-specific. This is hardware. This is what you call in associative learning the unconditional cue. It's hardwired. And when they uh, touch this with an antenna, they have their antenna, they have a taste receptor, and also taste receptors on the on the ovipositive and they make this contact they link whatever volatile odors are with that so it's an associative link when they taste while they smell they learn this odor which is the condition cue and they learn this odor means host it's like saying this is what the host is feeding on this is what they smell like in this patch of host and they start following that specific signal. So they can learn and update every time they encounter a different patch of host and know what they're feeding on, how it smells. So they then learn that plant signal for that situation. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's an incredibly quick. And that the learning process, if you release a, have a wasp or it naturally occurs, in a patch of hosts for about the first two or three hosts they encounter it's a little slower but then they learn what's occurring in this patch and the, the efficiency gets real strong through learning so the wasp learns and the caterpillar plant sends its signal and they are working together as allies competing and managing this sneaky caterpillar that's caught between <laughs> the two, kind of between the devil and the deep blue sea. So when we think about the capacity to learn, uh, there's the capacity to learn these various odors, which is really remarkable, but plants also change in structure and shape as they grow and mature as well. And I would imagine that the locations where caterpillars are found on plants also change as plants mature. We know that some larval insects focus on feeding on blossoms or on corn silk, for example, or something like that. So um, is there also learning that goes on in regards to the location of where these caterpillars might be found or these larvae might be found? The deeper the well, the sweeter the honey. The further we get into this, the richer it gets. Yes. Not only did they learn, these wasps, uh, we're talking about smart insects. <laughs> and that's the reason I used the title, you know, the subtitle, Talking Plants, Smart Insects. These little wasps, yes, they, uh, they learn color as well. So if you have a... Uh, caterpillar feeding on plant at one time and it's feeding on uh, a bud that's shaped a certain way and most of them are on these tender buds that in that situation or another as the plant grows further along and produces like cotton a white bloom they not only learn the odor if they are feeding primarily on white blooms they learn to go for those colors as well as the odor or the shape they can we we found they can learn shape they can now there's a hierarchy of those that if you had the right shape and, and the wrong odor uh that would it's they actually use the 
older as the primary, but it's an overlay. So they, they learn the combination of those. But uh, it, it is really learn all that information and make use of it. So they are very good at this. Now, <clears throat> the the they are also let me point out are nectar feeders the adult parasitic wasps uh, they are free free living they don't even though they to produce the young they, they've got to lay the egg and the the larval and the other stages grow on the caterpillar the adult wasp is free feeders and they feed on nectar so Plants like cotton produce what's called extrafloral nectary. And that's the, it's under the leaf. They have a little nectary source. When the plants uh, produce this nectar, that gives them a stronger alliance with the wasp. If they can provide that food as, for the adult wasp as well as the source for reproduction of the young, they are able to support those natural enemies strong. But the wasps actually learn to locate odor sources in the same way. They taste sugar water. If we, uh, we can do this in the lab, taste sugar while they smell an odor, they learn that odor means food. You could at the same time train them one odor for food and another odor for host. And if they're hungry, they'll go to the one that's associated with the food. If they're well fed, they will go to the one. So what they can do is learn. Let me, I'm maybe getting a little here. Let me back up. What it's an incredible system. They have these different appetitive needs. They have a need for food. They have a need for host. These appetitive needs, they're able to integrate that on in a brain, no bigger than a pinhead and learn these different uh, wow. and and, re and retrieve it and respond based on current need. If they're hungry, they go to the odors that they've learned associated with food. If they're well fed, they go to the one with the host. So a plant, actually, the other thing we saw, John, is that if, a, if the plant is being attacked and has caterpillars feeding on them, they increase the flow of extra floor nectar. So Intriguing. they are competing. What it, what it amounts to is these different plants out here are competing for different bodyguards. And if you have a plant that's producing the food as well as the host, they, the, the, you'll see that the wasp kind of develops an, uh, an affinity for that plant. And so they're actually are able to support the bodyguards better. This, this leads me to a question I was going to ask just a moment ago. You've already partially answered it. Um, and that was uh, from, a, from a practical perspective, what is the capacity of these parasitic insects and particularly parasitic wasps, which we're talking about, what is their capacity to provide effective control over an entire field Particularly, I mean, today we have these really large fields, hundreds of acres in size. And uh, I would almost have had the assumption prior to what you described a moment ago that there would be a pronounced edge effect where these parasitic wasps might come in from uh, weed strips and so forth along the edges and have an edge effect. But uh, it sounds from what you're describing that they may be able to cover an entire field. Yeah, they can. Now, that's that's on the assumption that see what the plant has these attributes. If you, uh, if you produce, you know, that, that one time they, uh, bred a line of cotton that was nectarless <laughs> with the assumption that, uh, if you don't have the nectars because things like the moth, the pests, uh, certain pests feed on the nectar too. And so with the idea that, if you didn't have the nectar, you would have less things like boll worms and army worms. But what we didn't think about uh, at that time was, well, the natural enemy has this too. So, you know, you need that. And so, yes, 
if if the plant is not producing the food directly, then they've got to travel away and go get food. And once they get hungry, because they, they, they've got that, these searching parasitic wasps, they've got to find their food once in a while and stop and feed and then go back because when they get hungry they for their energy, they've got to move. So understanding these attributes and what resources the wasp needs is very important. But yes, if you understand that and assure and make a point to see that the plant provides all those needs, it can operate just within the field and they're much more efficient. That's the value of having this kind of information. It not only allows you to develop plant with maximum attributes to support the natural enemy, it also allows you to provide the right agronomic practices so those attributes are maximized. For example, we found uh, with the signaling ability, if you get too much nitrogen, you can disrupt this. Or uh, certain varieties of cotton production don't produce it as well. And we were losing some of this in our domesticated varieties because we didn't know this attribute exists. That's really intriguing because excessive applications of nitrogen are a common characteristic of commercial cotton production. Yeah, it is true. Now, uh, just to go a bit further and talking about how uh, not only does the plant produce and, and the parasitic wasp uh, learn in association with food as well as the host, it's, it's important to understand that they, they uh, mark their, where they, they kind of carry a map within their uh, searching areas. They search a patch and they encounter a site for a caterpillar host and they crawl around on the leaves or sting that caterpillar. They leave a mark so that they don't come back and waste time on that again. So as they're operating, they kind of map where have they been and they have trails to tell them, hey, you, you're going back over the same territory. And you know what is interesting is they recognize the difference between their mark and other wasps of the same species mark. And, and <laughs> not only that, they recognize the, uh, whether this it's their mark or another female's mark and whether it's a sister mark versus uh, not a sister. We actually did studies in situations where we would compare the response to their mark, their own mark, that of other sister females and uh, another unrelated <laughs> member of the same species, conspecific, but a, not a sister. And they actually prefer, if they have, if they have a choice and have to operate only in the duplicated space, they will go and operate in that space versus their own. They avoid, they recognize the difference between the odors is the point. Wow. And also, there's the question, what about the very first, uh, when, they, when the wasp emerge and they are completely naive, they haven't encountered, how did they, how did they know what host plant to research? And they have preferences for some plants over others that's, that's built in. But also, when they're coming out of the cocoon, they get certain information. They carry a, a, a knowledge. It's called mother learning when they emerge within a cocoon. And the host that they developed in, it spins the cocoon. They weave a little bit of the frass and odor of the plant that they had developed on. And they emerge from that with that 
preference for that plant. That, but it's not hardwired. It's learned information they get from their cocoon. So would that be some of the information, the learned information that is lost when you raise insects in the laboratory? <laughs> You're right on, John. Uh, we actually did that demonstration and it explains some of the uh, release of lab reared parasitic insects in, in uh, attempts to use them like biopesticides, mass produce them and relieve. It, we were seeing situations where they just didn't respond good. And that's the explanation is that if you rear these wasps on artificial hosts feeding on artificial diet they're not able to have respond until now you can train those wasps and get them but you have to provide that training and that rearing for them because if you those wasps we actually did comparison wasps feeding from emerging from hosts feeding on artificial diet versus natural plants and the natural plant was much stronger from the first. So because they, it, it, we, you know, this you you see this, and it looks like it's built in, uh, but it's not. It's learned information. So the take home from what you're describing, in essence, is that um, rather than thinking about these predatory insects as biocontrols and purchasing them from a lab and releasing them, we really need to create ecosystems on our farms that propagate them naturally and that they're naturally present. We came to the conclusion that we refer to it as input substitution. You still use an inputs and using uh, natural enemies or other kinds of things as, uh, as biopesticides kind of thing. It, your, your most powerful method of first choice is to use the built in natural system they're much more effective because of a number of these types of attributes that we didn't understand as as i was saying as this interaction is going on there's it's it's built to operate together it, because of the feedback loops and so things that we're describing you've got the the power of the whole is greater than the sum of its part. And you take any part of it and you try to use that as uh, putting it together <laughs> by mass rear and release. And it's not the same as those natural systems because all these things that we don't fully understand and come together, it's, it's much more powerful than uh, mass rearing and releasing. Uh, you know, uh, now if you, there's certain ways you can improve on these. For example, in Europe, they use certain parasitic insects in greenhouses. And the way they get this to operate, rather than mass rearing these in laboratories, they actually, for an example, they deal with um, parasitic insects of white flies and other kind of things in the, in the greenhouse. And they take donor plants and they grow the white flies in the little cages that's over and they have a system where the wasp as it grows from its host on these donor plants and they place them that they emerge and naturally in that greenhouse and go to the produce plants and they operate because they're building it in and using these donor plants. If you see what I'm talking about, because that way they get, they emerge in that system naturally and get key information that they needed to operate. So you, you have to find a way nature is gives us the way if we will copy nature and draw on that, but without all this information, and it's so complex, the interaction, it's much more powerful to use the built-in system and, and rather than trying to put it together with uh, these artificial applications. 
So far, you've mentioned two different uh, potential management strategies from a plant management perspective that really stand out to me. One is you mentioned the impact of excessive nitrogen fertilization, which is so common. Secondly, you've mentioned the the value of these extra floral nectaries. And it occurs to me that the the sugar production of these extra floral nectaries and the volume of nectar being produced is almost certainly going to be correlated to the photosynthetic potential or photosynthetic activity of these plants. This is one of the pieces that we've observed that it's possible to greatly increase photosynthesis in plants when they have good nutrition. And again, also when they don't have excess of nitrogen. So for those of you listening, uh, this is in our work at Advancing Eco Agriculture, we actually have a lot of success and a strong track record of greatly reducing nitrogen applications on cotton and on other crops by as much as 60 to 70% and increasing photosynthesis. So if you would like to have more information about that uh, and learn how to do that or want to work with a consultant on your farm, please connect with our team at AEA and we can help guide you through that process. So Joe, thinking about all of this, um, the question emerges of what is, what is the potential of this knowledge? What, what's the potential if we apply it successfully? Um, to what degree can we reduce insecticide applications? To what degree can we develop an ecosystem where we're not dependent on quote unquote pest control products? We can, we can essentially back them out. I'm, I'm satisfied to that, John, that if you have a good healthy ecosystem and that's where we uh, need to focus. The fact that the, is these built in systems is the first it's the first team inputs and interventions must be a second team so we need we uh we pro provided and wrote a paper and produced i think it was 1998 and published it in the proceedings of the national academy of science uh after finding a number of these discoveries that we are talking about uh and we came to the point of view that we've got to move back to a total systems approach to pest management and agriculture production because um, the natural system is a powerful system and nature tells you the way to do this and we can see for an example we use cotton as our model in that in that study and showed that if you understand that system and use it, you can essentially remove high, the input of pesticides and a lot of your know, things like herbicides. And we showed that there are two key pieces that are important. One is that you need to, to perennialize the system, row crop systems that are highly disruptive because of clean tillage and so forth. You, create this monoculture and you kind of have to redo the growth curve all over every year because you're starting with a clean tail field uh, and you the idea in this monoculture production system of getting rid of with tillage and other thing everything but the crop itself all these other plants planting ditch row to ditch row is not a not a good system and so perennialize the system as well as understanding these quality attributes about what truly is a healthy plant and you do it right and keep copying and operating with nature uh, you can essentially back them out but the information of about uh, high input system, for example, that nitrogen and phosphorus, I think that you, you're probably aware of a lot of the studies that we, we, we're finding that the phosphorus and the uh, nitrogen recommendations that were provided for years was too high. There's a lot of good information about that recently. Yeah, they're just continuing to go up. 
Yeah, and there's all kind of environmental impact of that nitrogen, for example, and runoff and effect on waters and streams and rivers. But <clears throat> for example, in cotton, uh, particularly when we were able to eradicate the bow weevil, we moved in, in Georgia, uh, for example, from 20 applications, 17 to 20 treatments per year of pesticides, wow. insecticides to three or four within the first three or four years. And we were in on the way to backing them completely out. Um, but it's important to understand the power within the system. And I like to compare it because people can visualize and see it easy to health ma ma maintenance. You, you know, in managing your health, rather than using painkillers and antibiotics and those things, your first emphasis should be on good nutrition, rest, exercise, and those types of things. And then it's okay to use an input once in a while, a painkiller, but use it as the second team very sparingly and understand this as a part of the uh, rule of nature. Anytime you're using some intervention, whether it be a painkiller and antibiotic into the natural system, it's disruptive because it can't operate as a part of that built-in system. So you need to use it sparingly and not as the first team. And the same thing with uh, any in high input system interventionists, pesticides, fertilizers, and these things. Use inputs, interventions as the second team. Your first team is those built-in mechanisms of pest control and fertilizers and that type of thing. But first team is the built-in system. I want to make sure I'm understanding clearly one of the pieces you described. You, you mentioned that uh, you went from 17 to 20 insecticide applications. You reduced it down to three or four with the potential of going to zero, if I understood correctly. Yeah. Uh, what, what were the mechanisms or behaviors or actions that prevented going to zero on a large scale? Was it just the inclusion of nitrogen and, and other factors? <clears throat> well, no, I, more than that, I think it was the fact that we just, we had to be careful. We were very cautious to not remove it until you knew you were safe. Uh, we were getting there to remove it, but it, it, it was still uh, not knowing enough See, sometimes we are working with growers and situations and you're careful not to recommend or say, hey, don't treat, don't do this conventional application yet until you know it's not going to get the person into problems. So some of it was the lack of experience in how much you could, because a lot of times, see, you, you may have a pest outbreak that was reaching what has been established as the economic threshold. And you if you waited another day or two, you may not need that application. But until you know, <laughs> you're very careful not to recommend it. So more of it that was occurring, we maybe we could have gotten by without it. And we're on the way to do that. You know, uh, it, it strikes me just what you just said that we had these defined economic thresholds and perhaps we should wait a day or two and all of a sudden it occurs to me that in the ipm approach we identify economic thresholds of quote-unquote pests but we're not monitoring and not measuring in most cases the development of the parasitic insects and perhaps if we included those as a variable we might come up with new thresholds for what actually defined economic impact. Oh, you're absolutely right, John. Now, let me give you an example of a thing that occurred uh, during these late 80s and 90s when a lot of this work that we were doing was taking place with cotton. Some of the things that were occurring, we had uh, outbreaks of beet arming worms that had not previously been uh, pests of cotton 
and there was a little parasitic wall. And basically, it was a result of backing out some of these uh, pesticides that had been used earlier. It had had some cases where we were seeing beet army worms and cotton that had not occurred. Well, one, a little parasitic wasp called Cotesia mardian adventurous. It's, it's a little braconid parasitic wasp. And yeah, army worms were occurring in little clusters. They would have egg masses and it'd be a little cluster of small caterpillars feeding on the plant. This wasp, one of the things that happened when this wasp attacked this cluster of caterpillars and they completed the development and have these little white cocoons on the leaves and the farmers could see those. And it was their first experience of seeing nature at work and natural systems. And they would have these army worms that looked like they were going to be a big outbreak. And all of a sudden you see these little white cocoons all over the field. It became a very powerful demonstration of natural control at work and it became very helpful. And um, what they began to see as a result, when those cocoons were appearing, if you didn't left it alone, in a few days it was gone. The problem was no longer existent. Because of it being easy to see, it became a very strong encouragement to let nature operate. And yeah, uh, with a little more experience and, and understanding these natural systems uh and so it's there often the built-in system is there it's just a need to pursue it more uh <clears throat> but you have to operate with it as a whole because once you do intervene you disrupt the system you have the primary pest and then it triggers a secondary pest and this type of thing that's that's what we have to do we have to we have to work with it as a whole system. When you speak of primary pests and secondary pests, that actually reminds me of something that I have read about and I've observed, is that we, we now have pests in cotton and in other crops, uh, or I should say insects, that are reaching much larger populations and are much bigger problems than they were historically. I wondered if you have any perspective on that. Why is that? And what, do, what are the changes in the system that are bringing that about? Yeah, you restate that question again. Well, we now have insects like um, stink bugs that are causing major problems on cotton that aren't even described as being an issue yeah. 20 years ago. So okay. what has yeah. changed? What's different? That very, very good point, in particular for the stink bug, yes. What's happened in the post bow weevil area in the southeast and Georgia included as one of the where I'm operating? We've had stink bugs that's become a pest that was never a pest before. And part of it is uh, the fact that as you were able to back these uh, high inputs out, you get a different situation. But there are also uh, use of transgenic cotton has been used as a way of controlling things like boll worms. We actually have found and have some studies showing that when you have that transgenic cotton and you are not getting the boll worm activity, uh, even at a moderate level in the field that you had, and the in the response of the plant to the bollworm producing these signals to recruit the natural enemy that we had talked about earlier actually we have studies to show that that presence of the bollworm at a moderate level that the plant manages and suppresses with the use of its natural ally those chemical changes actually prevented the stink bug because those chemical changes that had a crossover of suppressing the the stink bug. Wow. You, you see what I'm saying? It is actually. Wow. Uh, so essentially the, the presence of 
my, my understanding, my interpretation of what you just said is that the presence of bollworm pressure changed the production of plant secondary metabolites yes. to have a suppressive effect yeah. on the stink bug population. Yeah. That's incredible. They have shown, and, and see, that's an incredible system of their interactions. It is a system. And that's the key central point. I want to stress it really strongly is you got to work with it as a system and, and to understand and appreciate the fact that these built in mechanisms are there and they're because of all these things that we've shown that the plant has an ability to signal it has built in ways to support its allies and to operate in conjunction with them this powerful system gives you avenues that are far more powerful than any pesticide if you will understand them and copy that system you know it's kind of like uh, what I just described is like a vaccination that has more than one uh benefit that it's broad it, it actually you can't have any good guys till you have a few bad guys you need early season a few herbivores to charge the system to jump start it early in the season it's like a vaccination and it's broader than just that one system that you may understand so this is this is perfect this is a perfect indictment of the word pest mm -hmm. these insects are not pests when they are present early season and that they're actually having a positive impact on the plant and the overall ecosystem. And, and I emphasize the fact that when you say pest, when you, when you get what you see and interpret as a pest, rather than, rather than saying, what do I use to kill that pest? It's vital that we, our first question is, why is that pest a pest? And what's out of balance? And how can I correct that and bring that back into balance rather than what do I use to intervene and kill that pest? It's huge difference in approaching it that way. So <laughs> a few moments ago, you mentioned uh, in passing the impact of transgenic crops. But what you're describing in essence is that if you have a BT cotton crop, which is the vast majority of cotton planted today, then you prevent this vaccination from ever occurring in the first place. You prevent these uh, beneficial worms from being present, which then leads to serious later infections of stink bug and perhaps other insects as well. Am I understanding that yeah. correctly? Yes, you are interested, and let me stress this even further. Practically all cotton production in the U.S. now is BT cotton. And in Georgia, the boll weevil was eliminated at, by 1990. And from BT wasn't delivered and put in place until three to four years later. During that interim, we had already reduced the number of pesticides from about 17 to 20, as I was saying, down to three or four. That had already occurred before BT cotton in it. We're still at three or four or five, primarily because of the stink bug. And the stink so BT cotton hasn't reduced insecticide applications at all. No, not if you look at those numbers. We, it was already there. Now, think about it. <clears throat> All the studies that we've done, that you, for, if you look in the literature, there are two parasitic wasps that we use uh, for our model system called Micropletus, Crocipes, Cardiocles, and Agriceps. Those two wasps that are probably two of the most studied parasitic natural enemies in the world through the 80s and the 90s. Now with our model system and a lot of other people have studied, those parasitic wasps 
only attack bollworm, the two species, the budworm and the bollworm, Heliothus zia, and uh, Helia coverpazia and Heliothus fluorescens. The budworm and the bollworm are the, the cornea Now with cotton, BT cotton, exclusive, we're talking about huge acreages all over the cotton belt. You would have no bollworms because you have put this in and the approach to prevent resistance is like shooting for 100% kill. Well, huge acreage. There are no bollworms out there. You can't have any good guys unless you have a few bad guys. So if you're having no bollworms, suddenly they're all removed from this huge acreage. Where do these, where, what's happened to these two parasitic wasps? I'm sure the populations have crashed. In fact, the Micropedus crustopes is, is a real question. It's hard to find it existence. So what is the, what is the ricochet effect, effect of suddenly removing? Yeah, okay, they're not a pest, it, but we are having to stack genes to keep the, this BT cotton and keep those bollworms out of there. It's, it's a, 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 what impact is having is an unknown, but it is, we know it has to be having an incredible effect on the natural enemy system because this is not only a pest, it's also a resource for natural enemies. You have to look at the whole system. And that's a great concern to me. And nobody is studying what is the, what is the other ricochets that's occurring in this system in addition to these parasitic wasps. Uh, if it's true, what the data that in a couple of those papers says that it's, it's all, it's, it's contributing to the outbreak of the stink bug. <clears throat> and and uh, what uh, what else? What uh, what's this protein that this plant is transgenic plant to produce this toxin that is producing? That has to come from somewhere. Yeah, and <clears throat> we don't know what all is uh, is going on, but uh, there are two guides that uh, I, I always point out that you need to use and if you want if we are going to move to a built-in natural system that we're talking about if that's going to be our first team um, then the transgenic is not and there are two attribute or two components that i like to say is one is it uh target specific and is it on an as need basis let me, let me explain that those two pieces are important elements and when you're dealing with managing a system, the if you use parasitic wasps or natural enemies, for example, as your control system to manage pests, if you're fostering them, they have those attributes. They have a, what's called density dependent uh, system. That is, if the pest gets down to a low level, they don't continue to occur you know the old cycle of the predator and the prey and the, the fox and the hare you, you it's then if the pest gets low the predator backs off and if it gets high it applies again so it's on uh as need basis your pesticide or in this case, BT cotton doesn't operate that way. It's every plant is producing that toxin all day, the entire plant, everywhere, whether you need it or not. No matter how low the pest gets, you're still producing it 100% every plant. So it, there's no density dependence there. The other thing is not target specific. It doesn't, you know, your, your parasitic wasp 
they only attack that pest on those plants that need it, not all over the field. And the BT cotton are like a pesticide. If you spray your field, it's not target specific. It's being expressed everywhere. Now, that's why in this the system that we talked about, the plant calling the natural enemy, it's inducible, not constituent. The, this little signal to recruit the natural enemy that's produced in response to the da damage is, is only induced when you have a pest feeding. If you spray a pesticide, it's expressed whether it's a pest there or not. It's not target specific and on an as need basis. You see the difference? It's, it's being expressed everywhere. That's why these things are so disrupted because they're expressed without regard to density dependence and they're not target specific. And I think as time goes by, if we look back at our history of developing uh, various technologies for use in agricultural ecosystems, whether those might be fertilizers or pesticides or transgenic crops, it seems practically always 20 or 30 years in the future, at some point in the future, we begin observing and discovering all of these secondary and tertiary impacts, unintended consequences that we don't know about. And I'm actually reminded of an experience, you know, many cases, as with the case of BT cotton, it's so widely adopted that we no longer observe comparisons. Where are the comparative fields or the comparison fields where um, there is no BT cotton? <clears throat> and how would that look different? Well, in many cases, we don't know because we don't have those comparisons. But we did actually, we have been working with a grower who does have a comparison of uh, BT versus non-BT cotton planted in the same field and grown together. And we observed one startling difference the following season. The weed populations in the two sections of the field were completely different. The section of the field that had BT cotton had much more aggressive weed species that were much more difficult to control. Why? I have no idea. Did it change the microbial populations as a result of different plant metabolites? Um, it's just interesting that we and I guess in reality, I also can't say that it might have been just the BT because there were different varieties as well. There might have been other things going on that I don't know about. But it was really interesting to observe this very pronounced and startling difference as a result of different types of plants, different varieties of plants being planted into the same soil and managed in practically identically the same way. Well, you're making a very powerful point. We know I have I work with a grower uh, that I talk about in, in full chapter is Alton Walker. In fact, I was at Mississippi State with him, and he now is a consultant and a grower in East Georgia. And he, by his own, just as, as a kind of a uh, almost a hobby, he's producing several hundred acres of cotton every year, and he is he's using. Uh, moving at a system of cover crops and input and he is uh, trying a very strong ecological approach using these principles that we're talking about and he cover crops is a very important part of his work and he's he's convinced in, in his system that you do not need to be tea cotton produce uh, and also that you don't need to level the herbicides and because of his production system for the last several years, he has the highest quality dry land cotton in that area. He has, has he won the award for the best quality. His staple length and all other attributes of the crop is not only is he producing and without the use of the high input system, he's getting better quality. And what, why is the quality? It, he feels certain it's because of the quality of the soil. Uh, yeah. And he doesn't need as much irrigation and dry land cotton. Is, uh, uh, and he's also now producing corn, which often 
you know, you they basically thought you could not grow corn in that area without irrigation. Well, he's able to do it when he uses this uh, cover crop system and improving the organic uh, uh, quality and the residue increase in the soil. He's able to, his moisture holding capacity is much important, much greater. I, I wanted to ask you about the use of cover <clears throat> crops as we see them from your perspective. You mentioned a little bit ago the importance of developing perennialized systems rather than annualized systems. And uh, you, you also mentioned not disturbing soil um, and not disrupting and having clean fields, etc. And I also think about uh, cotton and some of these plants have extra floral nectaries, but there are also many different crops that don't have extra floral nectaries. What is the value of using cover crops to provide a nectar source for wasps during the production season? Well, that can be. If you have a crop that doesn't have that nectar source, you know, that extra floral nectar and things on cotton, they ever plants got it. And it's a huge because we were quite impressed with the fact that as you begin to get damage, we showed that the, the plant actually increases the extra floral nectar flow and we also have studied these little wasps and showed that once they feed on the plant in that extra floral nectar they develop an uh, a preference for that plant <laughs> it's kind of it's it there we got to realize different plants are competing for these bodyguards and this is a powerful attribute to support so it's 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 beyond just some physiological benefit. It's and it's probably got multiple roles. But in the absence of those systems, you need that those alternative sources right there. They they can't afford this wasp can't afford to operate here. And when I need to go feed, travel out to the edge of the field and then come back. They yeah. need it. It's, it's very important. And this reminds me of, um, uh, I apologize, I'm forgetting the researcher's name, but research done in California on organic control of aphids on salad green crops, spinach and lettuce and so forth. And they discovered that if they plant in, mixed in with the crop, sweet alyssum mm -hmm. as a nectar source mm -hmm. at a rate of 100 plants per acre, if my memory serves me correctly, 100 plants per acre was enough to provide a nectar source for the beneficials to where they would provide complete control of the aphids. Mm -hmm. You think about that, 100 mm -hmm. plants per acre, that is going to have zero impact on right. yield, but it's very effective for insect control. Yeah. Well, they, see, there's several things that I think that's very important. It's not, it's important to have what they call a push and the pull. You need to provide the, the resources in the, with the diversity in general principle, a more diverse system is better. It's also important that you see in the earlier stages of uh, minimum, minimum teal, the idea was just to put more residue in the soil, but we were overlooking the importance of this perennialized system that this you're relaying natural enemies. Think about it. If you got a clean teal field, it's nothing to occur. And the ecological growth curve occurs in that occurs in that sigmoid manner. You can't get any good guys till you get some bad guys. You've got to begin to get populations of and so natural enemies comes rather late after you get the pests present. And you this real steep growth period that occurs is when you get a lot of oscillations and sometimes you pest outbreaks before you get to equilibrium. And so you're having to do that every year. Whereas if you keep a perennialized system, you stay at the top of that curve and you maintain a balance year round and you don't have to go through that lag effect every year. Not only that, it is important that we know now that the tillage disrupts that layering effect that's important in the quality of the soil. It's rather than the disc and the heron 
put that down and create that turmoil that also loses some of your carbon and so forth that's in the residue. So this, this perennialized system is a very important element. And so we've been able to move to the idea, not only use the cover crops to put residue back in, but to build the diversity and the stability in the system. And there are many attributes to it. I really like the one phrase you used of relaying natural enemies from season to season. That's very powerful because we're now having increasingly in, in the regenerative agriculture space, we're having conversations about relay cropping or relay cover cropping. And I like this term of relaying natural enemies mm -hmm. from one season to the next. Uh, I wanted to go back and also mention, um, I spoke about the value of sweet alyssum mm -hmm. or aphid control or as a nectar source. And if uh, any of you listeners want to dig deeper on that, I actually wrote about this research in a blog post on my blog at johnkemp.com mm -hmm. if you want to go find that and dig deeper. Um, Joe, the, the one question that comes to mind, uh, you mentioned that these relationships between these parasitic wasps and, uh, these larval and herbivorous insects have been extensively studied in cotton in particular. Um, what is the potential for this type of interaction to exist in other crops? Um, what, what is, what is the opportunity for effective insect population management in natural ecosystems or well-managed ecosystems for other crops? Well, I think the principle goes across the board. Uh, there's, and you were talking about what, what, which particular, you're talking about any particular interactions specific? Um, there's not, no, there's not any specific ones that come to mind, but, um, yeah, I mean, we have major challenges today with army worms, for example, in, in different parts of the country. Um, but there's, I mean, obviously there's a multitude of insects that are called pests. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that they only show up when we have compromised ecosystems mm -hmm. or compromised plant health to some degree. Or I should maybe rephrase that. Not that they show up, but they only become severely problematic in compromised ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, see, I, the this system that we use as a model is strictly a model. We see it across the board. Uh, and for example, we shared the Wolf Prize with uh, John Pickett. He's done the same kind of studies that we've done, and our colleagues in the Netherlands operating with the spider mite. Uh, and well, different mite systems. The, in in all of these cases, the plant supporting uh, its natural enemy in response to the herbivore is the same system. The, it, the, in our two colleagues that we work with in cooperation uh, with the, in the Netherlands demonstrated this induced signaling and recruiting the natural enemy with predatory mites versus herbivore mites. It's around close to the same time that we first demonstrated it with caterpillars. And, uh, it, and it's basically the same way. It's a damage. When the damage occurs, the plant detects it's under attack and begins to recruit these natural enemies. And that, that, collaboration uh, between the herbivore and the natural enemy operated in the same way. And, and by the way, we also demonstrated that this, these signals that the, the plant releases that attracts the natural enemy occur primarily during the day when the natural enemy is active. At night, you shift to a little different blend that often is a deterrent for herbivore <laughs> that uh, like moths that overposit at night. So these systems are, they operate in a, they're very broad mechanisms that apparently have a very uh, long standing uh, presence in the evolutionary history of the plants. 
it's it's not just a recent occurrence that's come in evolutionary time. It's a so I think these same systems operate in a very similar way. So I think we can uh, apply these principles that we're talking about: use of uh, quality of soil, uh, the uh, plant attributes to produce support for their natural enemies to deter pests, all of these things, but it is a web of interaction. And it all has to do with quality of soil, a greater diversity, uh, uh, use of, of supporting your natural enemies, uh, not planting high monoculture, but a mixture of plants in, in the right combination. And basically, building into the system, high interventionist system, whether it include chemical pesticides and fertilizers or the plow are interventions that we need to be very careful about. And those are second team. And it should occur sparingly and with recognizing that these can cause harm and be careful with them. Joe, this has been such a delightful conversation and you have such a, a wealth of experience. Um, the question that comes to my mind is what have we missed? What, uh, what, um, what's the question that I haven't asked? What's the topic you would like to talk about that we haven't touched on? Because I'm sure there's so many different aspects of your experience that we haven't uh, had the space to touch on yet. Well, uh, I don't, I think we've covered the, it's just a matter of where you put the greatest emphasis, but I, I, I think the, the key is to lead, is there a common denominator principle that we are talking about here that we want to leave in as a guide. And I think it, to me, it's, it's this, that is the thing that we were saying, do not realize that what has occurred in in uh, agriculture is uh, that over the years that we have as we developed this industrial agriculture era of high intervention systems we have moved to big monoculture systems and we we have in this intervention paradigm we tend to look for what to kill the pest with rather than why is this pest a pest. It's very important that we sh change that basic paradigm. Always in nature gives you the solution if we were to look at that primarily as our first way of doing it. What, why is this pest occurring? In any intervention, occasionally, yes, if there's a, a, I, I wouldn't tell folks never use a pesticide. But if you do use that or any intervention, uh, be very careful with it because it doesn't fit in as a part of your feedback loop. Now, I, I guess I would like to make one other point. It's bigger than just agriculture. What we have done is, is a, spending a great period of my time on the local city council and other things, all of this thing that's occurred and the change of our agriculture to a very highly centralized, specialized world. Uh, I do want to emphasize it's you can't separate it from our social human community elements. Not only have we lost the our sense of connection to nature and the way of managing these agriculture management systems and the pests with a more ecologically and landscape approach. We have lost the flavor of our local communities in these rural areas. Uh, if you drive throughout South Georgia, for example, 
and all these areas that were like I grew up with your crossroad grocery store and the little communities that uh, had the butcher baker, candlestick stick maker. Uh, the world is made up of systems within systems and the natural process is it's like a stratified system rather than a highly vertical system. Uh, and when you go with the realize that the average meal that you put on your table now, the chain of custody is like 1500 miles before it gets to your table. These high centralized food systems, it's a high risk for us for food security. So I'm kind of drifting over there where I'm, I think it's the other question. All this is interacted together. Uh, and we have a major food security problem and an issue that's of concern because this the same uh, way that the high production, high input agriculture has affected the way we manage pests and cropping systems has also uh, disrupted and has cause a loss in community at the local community level in these rural areas. You don't, you, you're, you, you, the highways of the country are littered with these little areas that where you had a, uh, a community crossroads that's not there anymore. You know, and I, I would suggest from my perspective that foundational to this loss of rural community is a loss of economic viability and reward in agriculture and in farming uh, where margins have become really narrow and this loss of economic opportunity has also led to a loss of uh, community in the pop in the countryside and that's I would suggest that's really one of the foundational the, the economic drivers is you you achieve what you incentivize and uh, you do not achieve what you disincentivize, which is what we have done collectively as a society over the last 70 years. And so I think this is one of the foundational principles. I, I really strongly agree with what you just described. But if we want to have a conversation about a regenerative agriculture, we need to remember the regenerative culture part of that as well. We also need to regenerate our rural communities. And to do that, we need to regenerate farm profitability. That's really at the foundation. And uh, that's why I believe, and what we have observed in our work at AEA is that uh, truly regenerative farmers, when the soil and plant ecosystem is functioning well and it's being managed well, they quickly become the high yielding producers, which means, and they also have reduced inputs, which means that they become the low cost producers, which means that they become the high profitability producers as well. And that's really, I think, at the foundation of what is going to be required to regenerate our rural communities. Well, you get, it, it, see, it gets you off the treadmill. You absolutely, I think a basic law, once you start this, these high centralized monoculture interventionist approaches, and you lose this built-in power through loss of diversity, uh, loss of the natural systems of you, you, you always get on a treadmill of input and that gets to the economics of it. But it also, uh, it, this it creates a centralized specialized system that re it, it moves toward the reductionist system that may be more economic on the short term but it begins to have a diminishing benefit. You always get on a treadmill where it takes more to get the same result. Let me take just a minute to mention, uh, if you followed ever Deming's principles, yeah. well, it's the same principle that I, I'd like to just take just a moment to apply to the agriculture management system that we're talking about. The Deming's principles that were he Edward Demings put into uh, in the production system. Like, for example, if you're producing an automobile and you have an assembly line, 
in this system that where everybody does their little part in the way you manage control or, or sheer quality is to have an inspector at the end of the line to reject anything that doesn't, doesn't look right and doesn't fit the system. And you, you create a game without end. That is the assembly line worker operating in competition with the, and they get increasingly uh, creative about getting it past the inspector. That's the, it appears always that to control a pest or any undesired variable is to produce a force like a pesticide to treat an undesired variable or a, uh, you know, anything or an inspector to create uh, quality in the it's a game without end and rather than to create a system and and basically when you have an undesired variable which basically the way he applied that into the industrial model of producing a product is say you just create these total quality work circles where if you have an undesired variable you just engineer it out the same thing occurs into agriculture production is if you have un, a pest outbreak, just redesign your system so the pest never becomes a pest. It's the same basic principle that we've got to operate in. Uh, anyway, the, these are some basic laws that we're talking about and loss of community. Uh, and what I, I've seen is some recent reports when this proposed solution for these things with uh, from management at the federal level and so forth is to build more roads, more fiber optic networks and into these communities and do more of the same. And I just felt that's not going to do it. We've got to go back to your point that you're making to regenerative agriculture. Uh, and all of that has got to start with us reconnecting to natural systems and understanding uh, operating is a part of our natural world. Absolutely. Joe, thank you so much. And friends, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Um, there's, I've, learned that some people are not aware that we produce show notes that goes with every one of these episodes. Um, if you're listening on a typical podcast um, platform, you won't have access to those show notes. But if you go to the podcast website at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com, then you'll be able to see all of the show notes. And we also put links in there to relevant links. We'll have links to some of Joe's work that you'll be able to see and read some of his papers and uh, some of the references and things that we discuss in the podcast. And I also welcome you to subscribe to the podcast newsletter. You'll be notified every time we release a new episode. And very importantly, if you're a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, and you have an interest in adopting this type of approach and methodology to your farm, uh, please connect with our team as well at advancingecoag.com, and we look forward to working with you. Joe, this conversation has been an absolute delight. Thank you for being here with us, for sharing your wisdom, and I look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you, John. I enjoyed it very much. It's a huge subject, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Without end. <laughs> Yeah.